Okay. So I'm going to talk about continuous delivery of both applications and infrastructure and what Mirantis is doing in that space. Um, so what is Mirantis all about? Really, we're about kind of our products, and those fall into two categories. Uh, one's called Mirantis Application Platform, and I'll be talking about that along with the demo in the second half of this. Uh, but first, we're going to start off with Mirantis Cloud Platform, which is all about continuous delivery of infrastructure. Um, so first, let's start off by uh, talking about how we're going to actually do that. Um, one of the comments that you might hear. Uh, Sounds awful. Okay, let's talk about uh, why this could make sense. What is OpenStack? It's, um, it's a set of infrastructure as a service APIs. It's software. It's a control plane for software-defined infrastructure. Again, it's software. Uh, do we need to build, test, and release that software? Yes. Uh, you could argue, what about dependencies? What about data plane components? Um, is it software? If yes, then yes. Honestly, even if no, then yes. You still need to build, test, and release those components. Um, so one of the objections you could have would be something like, uh, continuous delivery implies frequent change. Do I really want or need to frequently change my infrastructure? But I think it's important to kind of phrase that a little bit differently and actually make, make sure that you're defining what build and release mean in, in an infrastructure context. So what are, the, what are the things that you're actually doing with infrastructure or really an application as well when you build it or, or release it, really especially release it? You're deploying things, you're changing things, you're updating, you're adding, you're deleting, you're upgrading, and you're deploying more. Right? These are all the same exact actions that you would take running any application in a cloud that you would be making the same actions against an infrastructure platform. Um, just, just as in the application world, every single change that you make should, in, in, in some cases, must be tested before it rolls out to production. Um, but one thing that I think is important to, to say here is that there's going to be a lot of variance from use case to use case or operator to operator in terms of how frequently and uh, how frequently they, they make changes to their environment and also the scope of those changes. So what do you think? If I had a dollar for every time I agreed with you, you know, I'd be grumpy. I never knew that's what grumpy cat sounded like, Bruce, but thank you. No, it's awesome. It's okay. awesome. All right, fine. I'll show you. Uh, but first pictures. Let's talk about uh, Miranda's cloud platform real quick and show you what that looks like. So we really kind of carved the product into three, um, three monikers or three kind of buckets, if you will. Uh, one of them is a tool chain for lifecycle management. It's basically a very, uh, it's a set of common tools, open source tools that you'll see in DevOps tool chains and CICD tool chains, and we call that drivetrain. The second on the right, uh, that I'll talk about is Stacklight, that's operation system support. It's all things logging, monitoring, alerting, time series data, those types of things. And in the middle, really this is what you know, people want to actually build is these open clouds, right? They want to build an open stack cloud with software-defined networking and storage and various different types of compute, or they want to build a Kubernetes cluster on bare metal or in a public cloud or on top of open stack with the same types of implementation level requirements. So how does this actually break apart? Uh, I'll actually talk about the center first in this, uh, in this slide. Um, I mentioned Kubernetes and Open, OpenStack, but uh, when I talk about implementation layer and data plane earlier, really what we're talking about is software-defined networking implementation and software-defined storage implementation and uh, compute implementation, whether it's bare metal compute, virtual compute, container, container compute, uh, whatever that needs to look like. That's what we're, we're ultimately delivering to our customers, and our customers are then delivering to their customers. Um, again, on the Stacklight side, uh, I talked about ticketing, logging, monitoring, and alerting. If you guys are interested in learning more about what we're doing with Stacklight, because it is, it is pretty interesting in its own right, uh, follow up with us, because most of today's session is going to be focused on the continuous delivery side of things, and that's drivetrain. So what are some of the components that we need to build in order to have a tool chain for continuous delivery? We need a place to store infrastructure as code configuration. Um, so we need some Git repos to version control that. Uh, we need artifact repositories for the actual you know, Debian packages or um, 
container images or whatever they need to be that actually get deployed out. Uh, we need a code review system that can then be integrated both with a build server, automation server, and potentially with, uh, you know, third-party components like maybe there's a business review process for change control at an, at an organization and they want to, to integrate a change request in Garrett with something like ServiceNow or some other uh, mechanism that they use to review it for at a kind of a business level. And then you need the automation server I referenced, Jenkins, um, and you need some sort of low-level execution logic that you can build so that um, when you make a change, it actually knows how to how to uh, orchestrate that change. So and one example would be you want to change a configuration parameter in Nova. Well, it's fine to just go write that to a file, but that job's not done there. You actually need to restart the service. If you're doing package updates, you need to do that in an intelligent way so that you're not disrupting or you're at least minimizing the disruption for control traffic in that cloud. Um, and then lastly, uh, configuration management tools on their own. Um, one of their, I guess, one of the deficiencies we see is they don't have a really elegant way to handle hierarchical class definition and uh, you know, flexible roles, like those kinds of things that are easily uh, moldable and don't require you to repeat yourself. So we use reclass for that purpose. Um, all right, so getting back to what I started this little section about doing a demo, I'm gonna actually consolidate this into a fairly simplistic pipeline. So. Um, we're not going to have a whole lot of uh, like third-party integrations or anything. We're just going to go with the basics here. So I'm going to submit a change as an operator to a Git repository that's storing the stateful configuration of the cloud that we've deployed. Um, I'm then going to review that change in Garrett, and that's going to trigger a pipeline, uh, or a Jenkins job that's going to roll that out to the cloud that I've built. In this case, it's an OpenStack cloud using Salt. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> All right. Cool. So I have this OpenStack cloud at lab.marantis.com, and I have a Garrett instance that I'm going to go trigger a change with. So I'll go ahead and create a change, put it on the master branch because this is a lab. I'm going to change something simple like uh, CPU allocation ratio for Nova. I'll change it to 20. Okay, go ahead and edit and add the file. I talked about roles earlier, so one of the roles that we have defined in this lab is uh, OpenStack control. So I'll go ahead and open the control.yaml file for OpenStack, and that has in it, did I just click cancel? Yeah, I did. a number of different classes. Remember I mentioned hierarchical class definition. These are a whole bunch of classes that Mirantis ships. Anytime you see a system in front of them, that means Mirantis is providing these classes. Every key value pair or parameter that's defined in those classes is overridable by our customers. Um, now that may be ill-advised in some cases, but it is possible. Um, here I've actually exposed CPU allocation ratio, and this portion of the model is actually what we call the cluster model, and that's where our customers interact with this infrastructure as code. We've actually defined this value, I think, as eight is the default that we've defined in a system class, but we're overriding it here simply by defining the key value pair again. So in this case, it's already 20, so I'm actually going to put it at 16. Um, save that. Close. Publish. Publish. And again, since it's a lab in this case, I would normally be able to review my own change, but apparently my colleague just <laughs> revoked that privilege from me. Um, so I'll go ahead and make sure I'm logged in as admin over here and review my change. Yeah. Go ahead and check. Yeah, I'm 16. Okay, so I'll review that and submit it. Okay, from here. I'm going to go ahead and actually launch uh, one of the pipelines that we ship as a default that's a kind of exposed through Jenkins in drivetrain uh, called update service configuration. Before I do that, though, I actually want to show you uh, there's, a, there's quite a catalog of different pipelines that are aimed at specific actions that an operator might want to take, and all of these can basically be forked and get, they're stored in Garrett as well. They can be forked in Garrett, and you can mold them to what you want and cherry pick, basically. Uh, what you want from that as you kind of 
uh, mold those. So we have two layers to our pipelines. One is uh, these pipelines that you're seeing here, but in the background, they're actually using a whole bunch of functions that are defined in another repository, again, stored in Garrett. So we have this kind of layered approach that allows you to mold these to exactly what you want to accomplish. Uh, one of these pipelines is a simple, well, it looks simple, but deploy OpenStack pipeline, and it's actually deploying drivetrain itself, which is all the components that you see here from a day one image that includes a mini miniature version of this. It's deploying a KVM hosts using Maz, and on those KVM hosts, it's creating virtual machines that are gonna host a control plane for OpenStack, for OpenContrail, for uh, Ceph monitors, for whatever components we need. Um, and then it's gonna install uh, OpenStack infrastructure, or actually it's gonna configure all these Linux hosts with basic things like NTP and OpenSSH, install OpenStack on it. Uh, in two stages, we have control and network, and actually three stages, and then compute. Uh, similar to what we're doing with Ceph, and then lastly, Stacklight. And our metadata model, when it gets generated initially, has all of the information that glues all of these components together, and what you end up with is a fully functional cloud with a fully functional uh, LCM tool chain, OSS tool chain, and the cloud that you wanted to deploy to start with. Um, okay, so back to the other pipeline that we're actually gonna run real quick, given our time constraint, update service configuration. This is really designed for changing configuration parameters, just like what I did. Um, it has logic for each service that says, if I change something in Keystone, like policy.json, I need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have logic for doing things like package upgrades, right? That's a separate pipeline for a reason, and because it calls different functions. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and rebuild this. Uh, and go over these parameters. So one, uh, I have a, a, uh, a Boolean that says, do you want to pull the model uh, that you just made a change to? If I say no, it's just gonna run whatever's local in that cloud. But if I say yes, then it's gonna actually pull that from Garrett before it runs this, uh, this pipeline. Uh, I can target different salt masters, which means I can have a single drivetrain targeting a number of clouds or Kubernetes clusters or whatever they are uh, and different salt masters. I can do master of master with salt. I can do a whole bunch of different things there. Uh, I target that by using the API URL that salt, uh, salt exposes. Um, and I have some targeting parameters. I can specify uh, how many nodes I want this uh, to apply to at a time, so basically a batch size. I can target specific uh, roles or I can target specific host names, a whole bunch of different targeting mechanisms. Um, and then the application states that I actually wanna go enforce or change, in this case, Nova. Um, then the target subset is really about like, you could call it A, B, or blue, green, but realistically selecting one node in production to implement the change first. It could be, you know, you do the same in staging, see what the reaction is on that one node, do some API requests, see what it does before you continue. And we actually do integrate in some of our, uh, in the more sophisticated version of this pipeline, we would integrate things like Rally and Shaker and Tempest so that we could do more comprehensive automated testing. Um, okay, and then the last uh, uh, thing that I want to show, actually I should have done this before, um, I'll show you from a CLI whether or not it's actually gonna change these things. Can you guys see this or is this too small? There we go. So this is CTL01, let's grab CTL02. These are the controller nodes and do the same. Okay, so as that pipeline is running, it's actually gonna do a few different things. And to interact with it, I can either hover over the over the stage and it'll ask me the question. It's asking me to approve whether or not I wanna make this configuration change on the node that it selected, in this case CTL02. Um, but I wanna actually go in and look at what the console output looks like. So that I can get a little bit more detail about what it's gonna change. 
Okay, so here it's asking me that question. One of the things it's doing before it even selects a node to run this on is it actually runs a simulation and tells me exactly what's going to change. And in this case, it's going to basically restart Nova, and it's going to change the value of uh, uh, CPU allocation ratio and nova.conf on this controller. I'll go ahead and approve that change to roll out to that one node that was selected, the CTL02, and we should see that almost immediately. Yep, so. There. The change actually took effect on CTL02. Now it's going to restart Nova. And uh, in a couple of minutes, or actually in a couple of seconds, it should uh, progress to applying, to asking me if I want to apply on the remaining nodes. While that's going, let me show you a little bit about Stacklight since we have some time. Um, I mentioned. Uh, Stacklight being an LCM toolchain, logging, monitoring, and alerting. Uh, from a monitoring perspective, uh, we basically use Fluent, I'm sorry, we use a mixture of FluentD and Telegraph with Prometheus as well as, uh, Kib or, I'm sorry, Grafana to visualize that. And we've created a whole bunch of pre populated dashboards for various components that can get quite deep in terms of what information that they'll show you. Um, some of the more interesting ones might be something like, what, how many keystone requests am I seeing? Hardly any, but um, I can get very granular in terms of what I want to look at. Uh, in this case, I have Cassandra cluster running because, um, because I'm running open contrail. Um, but basically, we monitor not only the uh, cloud platforms themselves and all of their components, but we're monitoring Stacklight itself and, and Drivetrain itself as well. Um, let's switch back over to Jenkins. Okay, so it's still applying. Forgive me, I have 5% battery, so I'm gonna grab a power supply while that finishes. So it's asking me if I want to confirm that change on the other nodes. Again, if I go to the console status, I'll basically see a green output for all of the things that it actually went and changed, and it'll be asking me, do you want to proceed on the other two nodes? And I'll say yes. Okay, so that will go ahead and finish, and we'll see basically this change on the other node that I was running it on. Yep, it already changed on the other controllers. So this is a really simplistic change, guys, but the cool thing about this is that everything, every action that you want to take really follows the same process. It's completely auditable um, and automated. So a lot of these kind of um, manual actions you're seeing me take are kind of optional, right? Like you could configure uh, your test harness in such a way with Tempest, Rally, and Shakers so that you have a high level of confidence and maybe you don't even need to uh, manually trigger the job. Maybe you want it to automatically trigger in staging and manually trigger in production. These are all tunable actually through the same metadata model that we're defining the, uh, the state in. Um, similar metadata model for drivetrain. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much the demo, guys. Um, I wanna move on to Matt Morantis application platform, but before I do, let's um, kind of do a little bit of recap. Uh, as for, in terms of highlights for MCP, there's really two that I want to highlight. One is it's an infrastructure as code uh, um, model-driven architecture. Um, a couple of key principles here is we don't want to repeat ourselves in our metadata model. That's why we have a, need a hierarchical class structure that Request gives us. Um, we want to enable ourselves and our customers to be very flexible in how we define roles. That means you saw I had CTL nodes with every OpenStack control service on them and that list of classes that was applied to openstackcontrol.yaml. I could just as easily define a keystone.yaml and have a single uh, instance with nothing but keystone services. Basically just splitting out those classes and applying those to a different role is all I have to do in order to split those services out. Um, the second point is that it's all pi pipeline-based automation. There's really three stages to that. There's build, test, and release. Build, you could kind of look at in a number of different ways. Either you're building artifacts in typical CI kind of methodology, or uh, in this case, what I look at build as is, is that you're, you're rolling that change to staging and getting an automated result that says, yes, everything still seems to be working. Um, and that's the test portion. Um, 
and then release, like I, like I mentioned, there's a num number of different methodologies you can use from blue, green, and AB to, uh, in the case of compute nodes, most people opt to do rolling upgrades or updates or changes to compute nodes so that they're not blasting that out to you know, three, 5,000 nodes at a time. Um, Okay, and then lastly, rollback capabilities. So if we were to use our update or upgrade pipelines, those have uh, embedded in, in them an optional rollback stage. that You can kind of just leave hanging there for a number of days, and if you encounter an issue or, or you have uh, an issue that gets detected, you can roll that change back in a number of minutes. Okay, so that's it for uh, Mirantis Cloud Platform. Now let's talk about the application platform. Okay, so a typical software delivery workflow looks something like this inside of an enterprise. You have what, you know, I'm gonna call here a platform service team, and what they're doing is building golden images with uh, appropriate security control agents or monitoring agents or whatever it is that they wanna install, specific versions of Python or other runtimes or, or whatever they are. And they're calling those gold and they're shipping those to a repository for all the developers to build on. Then you have an application team that then needs to layer their application on top, create another image potentially, or just install it and then you know, put it in production. Um, and then usually you'll have a, a handoff between those application teams and the release management teams where uh, they really need to nail down exactly how that's gonna get rolled to production and a whole bunch of if-then uh, scenarios that they need to understand before they can actually roll that out. And what we're trying to do by automating that delivery workflow is really saying, okay, you guys are all doing these different things and there's all these verbal or, or process-based handoffs. Let's automate as much of that as we can and unify the system of, of change so that um, you guys are all using the same system. You guys can have whatever visibility uh, the, um, the administrators of this platform want to give each organization. And then there's rules about who is allowed to change what at what layer of the application. Um, so there's governance there, there's auditability there, and there's, there's consistency there. Um, so what we've built is basically Mirantis application platform is based on Spinnaker as the kind of primary entry point for users of this platform. Um, it contains a whole bunch of embedded best practices from Netflix, they're the ones that open source this. Um, there's been contribution from Google and Capital One and Mirantis, um, but really it's, a, it's a, it's a really elegant tool for, for a immutable infrastructure pattern. That means that you're shipping uh, VM images and container images as artifacts and you're running and deploying those to production in a cloud. Um, so you use declarative pipelines to define how that gets done. Uh, all of this leverage is open source in an active community. There's no closed source components in MAP at all. Um, and there's tons of integrations with um, cloud ecosystem, right? Like you have cloud drivers for AWS and Azure and uh, GCP and GKE and Kubernetes and, and other systems like Slack and, and other build tools. Um, and Jenkins is usually behind the scenes also uh, contributing to some of those points of integration and logic. Um, okay, so what does it actually end up looking like is something like this. I just touched on kind of what that ecosystem looks like. Um, and uh, it, you'll obviously need to, need to integrate with other things like identity providers. Um, but let's get to a demo. Let's get to the interesting stuff before we run out of time here. Um, okay, so first of all, I have this actually deployed in GKE. Um, and again, I mentioned the first entry point being Spinnaker. So let me log into my Spinnaker instance. Okay. So I really have two applications in this, uh, in this application that I'm gonna interact with. Two application groups from the perspective of Spinnaker. The, the purpose of this is to say that this group of people is allowed to make changes to their running application and this group of people is allowed to make changes to the kind of platform service layers. In this case, it's a Python version is how we're defining the service layer. Um, so we already have a running application. It's basically this, uh, um, data pipeline consisting of Spark and, and HDFS and a couple of other things, uh, pulling uh, from the Twitter API, pulling popularity of a number of different hashtags in a geolocation and displaying those along with a couple of different things like Python version and uh, when it was last updated. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a change as the platform service uh, owner where I'm, I'm basically responsible for making sure that we're running the correct version of Python in our applications. And I'm gonna go make a change in Garrett again to how 
to what version actually, um, to what version of Python is included in the base image that that application is leveraging. So I'll go ahead and create change. This is a Docker image, so in this case, all I need to change is Docker file. Instead of defining a uh, Alpine Linux uh, package for Python of two, I'm gonna say three. Save that, close it, publish my edit, publish it. I'm admin so I can review my own change. And as soon as I click submit on this, it's actually uh, going to trigger in, in uh, Spinnaker a run of the pipeline to build that image. Okay, so let's jump over to Spinnaker and take a look. There it goes. Okay, so let's take a look at the details of what that pipeline's gonna do. The first thing it's gonna do is build that Docker image. It's gonna deploy that to a staging environment, uh, which is a namespace on the same Kubernetes cluster in this case. Um, and then it's gonna run some tests. In this case, it's gonna run Claire, which basically does CVE uh, scanning and reporting. So it's gonna report on any, uh, uh, any critical vulnerabilities that uh, are picked up by Claire and I'll see those as soon as it gets to that stage. In the meantime, there's actually a couple of other things uh, that I'll show here. One is that behind the scenes, we're actually using, uh, behind the scenes of Spinnaker, there's usually going to be Jenkins. Jenkins defines things in a little bit of a different way. Uh, there's some things that are just friendlier to do in Jenkins or have plugins in Jenkins, and you can use and leverage that logic from Spinnaker by defining the, the um, uh, the pipeline in uh, pipeline uh, in Jenkins, and then gluing together multiple pipelines into a Spinnaker pipeline. Um, one of the things that we're shipping is this Meta Create Jobs. So we actually have a huge library of uh, of different jobs that we ship as part of this product, and it gets deployed. Uh, it, this job gets deployed out initially. You run this job, and it's going to basically clone from a whole bunch of different Git repositories all of these different types of typical jobs that you would want to run. Um, so you'll all these Python base um, pipelines that you see here are actually being run under a single pipeline here in Spinnaker. Okay, um, before I move on to this, I do wanna show that I mentioned Claire showing CVEs. It actually scans six layers of that Docker image and found the same vulnerability, actually 13090, in two different layers. And I can just grab that URL, plug it in here, and see exactly what it is. It's actually related to wget package that I have installed inside that. Uh, I actually installed that package deliberately to show this. So um, you can actually set thresholds in uh, a combination of Claire and Spinnaker to say that if you have any security vulnerabilities detected by Claire, that job fails. In this case, I'm gonna allow, allow it to succeed by saying that I think the value that we have set is like 10, uh, if there's any more than 10 CVEs detected, that it will, it'll fail the job. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and let that through. Okay, so cool, so I have a new image that didn't really change anything about my application. My application's still running on Python version two. Um, okay, but the next time the application owner decides to make a change in this case, uh, what happens? So let's find out. Take a look at my project list, and now me as the application owner, I'm logging in and making a change to my application. I just wanna change HTML headers to show something different. Okay. So we can see Let's go ahead and put the date. What is it, May 22nd? Yeah, 22nd. We'll put 
the date in there. Save that, close it, publish it, review it. Okay, so after I hit submit on this, we'll switch uh, context over to the application space for this, uh, this TweetViz application. And in just a second, we'll actually see this, uh, this get triggered as well. So it'll actually trigger a uh, change to that environment. And, and I'll run through the details of that. It'll be kind of interesting. Um, the first thing it's going to do is fetch the most recent Python base image. Uh, you can, as the application owner, depending on what you allow as an administrator, allow them to tag whatever they want, or you can lock it down to they're only allowed to take tag latest. In this case, they're only allowed to take tag latest. Um, so it's going to fetch the most recent Python image, and then it's going to deploy that image with the application to staging. Um, and uh, in this case, what staging means is actually another namespace in Kubernetes gets spun up, the entire application, or actually the web layer of this application gets spun up in that namespace, and then it shows you the output of that. Uh, and I can actually log into, uh, or I'm sorry, navigate to that. Uh, that staging version of my website as soon as it gets to that point. Okay, what else can I show you while that's going on? Um, we did talk about the functional components that are installed in, in, as part of just the MCP base, but um, let me elaborate on that a little bit. So Spinnaker, uh, Jenkins, and Garrett are kind of there for uh, working backwards version control, uh, kind of a lower level definition of pipelines, and then a higher level definition of pipelines and deployment logic, specifically for uh, continuous delivery. So, you guys might be aware that you know things like Travis and and uh, and Jenkins and, and and others are really aimed at continuous integration around packaging artifacts, whereas tooling like Spinnaker is actually developed entirely around the idea of deploying to production. Right, that's the goal of Spinnaker. Um, so that's a little bit of a uh, why that kind of layering approach happens. Okay, so we've deployed to staging. Let's go ahead and take a look at the staging version of my application. Okay, so I see the HTML header actually changed and now has the date, but it more importantly has a new Python version. We can take a look at production, make sure that hasn't changed, I'll refresh the page, there's no change to that. And what uh, Spinnaker is gonna do in this pipeline that I've defined is again run those same tests uh, on that image after the application layers are added and then give me basically a result on that. So I'll take a look at the results and see what they look like at the application, with the application layers. So wget isn't installed any, it isn't changed at all by the application layers, so it's not gonna actually uh, change our output on that. Um, now it's gonna ask me after it's deployed to staging while staging is still live for me to inspect whether or not I wanna, wanna continue to push that change to production. When I choose to do this, two things are gonna happen. The first thing that's gonna happen is it's going to shut down the staging environment, so we'll see my staging version just went down. Um, and the other thing that it's, gonna, that it's gonna do is actually implement that change in a rolling fashion out to, um, out to um, uh, the Kubernetes cluster that's running in the production namespace. While this is going, let's take a look at our production version and keep refreshing. Okay, so it's it, the, the, the pod replica that I just hit yeah, it looks like it's on all of them now. Okay, so we've, we've, uh, we've implemented two changes by making an application change. One we made as an application owner, the other, the platform service team modified our base image and that's automatically being consumed when I make an update. In this case, our application is compatible with both Python 2 and 3, so that's why we're able to do that. Okay, um, that's it for demos, guys. Um, Why don't we open it up for any questions that you guys may have? By the way, if you want to reach out to me, it's just Ryan at Marantis.com uh, or come by our booth in the marketplace. Uh, any questions, please feel free to step up to the microphones and myself and my colleagues will do our best to answer any questions about either MCP or MAP. 
No questions? What was that? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, not sure. Yeah, yeah. They will be published on the OpenStack website. If you don't see them for some reason, I have an easy email address, so. Well, if there are no other questions, I think it's beer 30, so let's, uh, let's go make that happen, guys. Thank you. <laughs>